Right, my gorgeous little ducklings. K. Jesus Christ, we're getting through this alphabet. It's a chore getting all of these done in time. I am telling you, it's <laughs> it's quite a bit off more than I could chew. It's fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. So, K. We begin with Kirkwall. You know, Varric, I went to Kirkwall once. Yeah. Bit of a shithole. Yeah. Kirkwall is a city in the Free Marches and the setting for Dragon Age 2. Founded by the Tevinter Imperium in ancient times, Kirkwall was originally called Emerius. I think that's how you pronounce that, Emerius? Yeah, let's go with Emerius. And was established by Tevinter Magister Emerius Craven. It became the centre for slave trade in the Imperium, and its location on the Waking Sea makes it a strategically important port throughout its entire history. The city was actually one of the mightiest in the Imperium, believe it or not, and thrived for centuries until the assassination of an Alamari slave named Rudan prompted a slave uprising and the Magisters were overthrown. Uh, Amarius was then renamed Kirkwall. So there you go. So Kirkwall has long been considered a cursed city. The veil is uncommonly thin in Kirkwall, and the Circle of Magi has a much higher rate of mages for failing their harrowings, or succumbing to blood magic or possession, than in most of Thedas. Um, yeah, so there are a couple of possible reasons for this. Corypheus is imprisoned very close to Kirkwall, and the Grey Wardens speculate that his presence has some sort of effect on the surrounding area and its people. Another, I think, more likely explanation is the series of tunnels and warrens beneath the city. So it is said that during the reign of the Imperium, Magisters conducted numerous magical experiments in the tunnels under the city. Uh, the city seemed to consume slaves at an extraordinary rate, with thousands of slaves in the city simply disappearing, kind of once they got there. So remember, this was like a hub of slavery. You know, this was like the centre of the imperial slave trade. Uh, and like thousands of slaves just vanished once they got there. So they were most likely used as sacrifices in blood magic rituals in the tunnels under the city. Although no one knows the exact nature of the experiments performed in the warren beneath the city, it's been observed that the pattern of the corridors matches that of certain magical glyphs, and that grooves carved into the ground were likely designed for blood to flow down. So yes, that's cheery, isn't it? Kirkwall has a bloody history even beyond the time of the Magisters. It was invaded by the Canari and held for four years during their initial invasion of Thedas. The Canari were eventually forced out by Orlais, who then occupied the city for around 40 years before the city rebelled and gained their independence. Their leader still carries the title of Viscount, however, which is an Orlesian title and is from when the Orlesians ruled. Uh, and many of the city's noble families appear to have Orlesian heritage as well. There's a lot of Orlesian accents in Kirkwall and a lot of Orlesian names. Kirkwall also ordered a brutal cull of all nugs in the city during the Fourth Blight, fearing that the creatures carried the blight. So yeah, bloody history, Kirkwall. Very bloody. Kirkwall's history of slavery is apparent in its architecture. The Gallows is a great fortress separate from the city where the slaves of old would be taken when they arrived in the city. So it's on a little island itself, the Gallows. Um, and that's where the slaves would first be taken when they arrived. Uh, executions took place in the gallows daily, and the Magisters built great statues depicting chained slaves to try and break the resolve of those arriving. Those statues still stand in the gallows today, though the fortress is now the Circle of Magi. Uh, numerous wall murals can be found throughout the city depicting slaves in chains as well. Exactly why all of this stuff still exists, we're not really sure. Like, you would think that once the city had freed itself from the Magisters, they would have taken down all the statues of chained slaves, but apparently not. Uh, in the games, Kirkwall becomes famous as the site of a mage uprising against Knight Commander Meredith after the destruction of its Chantry by the apostate Anders, an event that contributed significantly to the outbreak of the Mage Templar War a few years later. So, yes, um, Anders destroyed the Chantry, and Meredith decided to invoke the right of annulment against the Circle for reasons. Like, Anders wasn't even in the circle. But anyway, she was like, oh, yes, let's invoke the right of annulment, and then the mages had to rebel, and it all went quite wrong. Kirkwall's quite a, a bloody place. Yeah, the veil is very thin in Kirkwall. We know that, and we know that, you know, there's a lot of blood magic and demons kind of around because the veil is so thin, and it's just sort of generally quite a cursed sort of place where lots of nasties uh, accumulate. It also, of course, draws the attention of one of the forbidden ones that we talked about in the... Uh in the last episode. So yes, it's it's a it's a it's a lure for demons as old Kirkwall. Anyway, next wait for it. Krogan. I am Urgot Rex, and this is my planet. Yes, you heard me correctly. 
Krogan. Have you forgotten what game you're talking about, Magpie? No, Magpie. No, I haven't. Anyway, yes, Krogan. The Krogan are an alien race from the planet Tuchanka in Bioware's Mass Effect video game series. They do, however, make a number of appearances in the Dragon Age games. Most notably, the heads of several Krogan appear as trophies in numerous Orlesian houses, particularly in the Winter Palace in Inquisition and in the Mark of the Assassin DLC in Dragon Age 2. Why is this worth mentioning, I hear you cry? It's just a daft Mass Effect Easter egg. Well, there's a bit of a fan theory concerning some Codex entries you can find in the Descent DLC for Dragon Age Inquisition. You can find a series of journal entries detailing a long-forgotten war between the Dwarves and an unknown race called the Scaled Ones. That's not all. In the Jaws of Hakon DLC, another Codex entry can be found. It is mostly the mad ravings of an unhinged conspiracy theorist, but in amongst it there is reference to an ancient war fought between Tevinta and the Snake Kings whoever the hell they were. Finally, in several elven ruins, you can find mosaics that depict strange reptilian-like humanoids. Some fans have pieced all of this together and come up with two theories. One, the writers at Bioware are alluding to some unknown race that lives beneath the earth, perhaps came into contact with the ancient civilizations of Thedas and may possibly feature in future games. Or two, the whole thing is an elaborate joke slash Easter egg referencing the Krogan. <laughs> Perhaps the most compelling evidence for the second theory is that nearby to one of the Scaled One's Codex entries, you can find a Krogan head with a Dwarven axe stuck in it. Of course, personally, I think there might be a third theory, which is that the writers are in fact hinting at a future crossover game between Dragon Age and Mass Effect where the Krogan invade Thedas. Okay, okay, to be honest, that one's not very likely, but seriously... I would pay money for it. I mean, come on. Especially if it like also involved like, you know, a group of Asari commandos turning up to help repel the Krogan invaders and then my protagonist can shack up with an Asari. I think that would be cool. But, I mean, come on, that's at least got to be worth like a DLC or something. Like, how eh? Please? Come on. Can you imagine if you had like, like a Kanari warrior and an Asari matriarch? Or even like a Kanari mage. Like, imagine like a Kanari mage. A female Kanari mage and an Asari matriarch. I think that's my new fantasy. I think, yeah, somebody's going to have to write that fan fiction, I think. Um, yes, anyway, what was I talking about? Um, yes, uh, Krogan references. Yes, anyway, <laughs> there are actually numerous Mass Effect references in the Dragon Age games, some of which have fans speculating that they take place in the same universe. So the moon in Origins is the same design as the Mass Effect planet Clendagon. It is also worth noting that in Inquisition, the moon has a different design and is notably bigger. This is explained away in Dragon Age lore by Thedas having two moons, yet for some reason we only see the little one in the first two games and the big one in the third game. I don't know, do you think we'll see both together in Veilguard? Who knows? I don't know. It just seems... I mean, the Inquisition one looks cooler, but it always bothered me that you don't get to see the Origins moon in Inquisition. That always bothered me. Uh, yes, a Darkspawn Ogre turns up in Mass Effect 2 during Kasumi's DLC, which is one of the very few, in fact, I think only definite Dragon Age Easter eggs in the Mass Effect games. The Dragon Age Easter eggs are very light in the Mass Effect games. Um, yeah, that's like the only definite one. There's a few like little lines here and there that people speculate are references, but uh, I think the, the Ogre is the only one we kind of know for definite. Uh, most other Mass Effect references in Dragon Age are just dialogue, so coal is a gold mine for little Mass Effect references, as well as references to all sorts of things. Um, he also has a, he actually has a Disney reference. Yeah, Cole has a little Disney reference um, that you can find if you're very lucky. A bird saw it by the window and carried it off to show it the world. It likes things that are shining, shimmering. Splendid. I am also personally convinced that this Dagner conversation... Can I take a sample? A sample? Oh, that sounded sinister. I meant, can I cut a little piece off of you and do things to it? That didn't sound better, did it? ...is a reference to this Liara conversation. Sounds like you want to dissect me in a lab somewhere. What? No, I did not mean to insinuate. Uh, I never meant to offend you, Shepard. I only meant that you would be an interesting specimen for an in-depth study. Uh, no, that's even worse. But that's just me, I don't know for certain. Perhaps the most bizarre fan theory that both games take place in the same universe is that the design for the Geth is eerily similar to the design for the Shades. Hinting that, I don't know, there's Geth in the Fade or something? I don't know. 
But you know what? I have long said that Dragon Age seems to do a lot of like fantasy versions of sci-fi concepts. Like hive mind with the Darkspawn. The Darkspawn's basically like a hive mind. So like to me, the Fade almost feels like a virtual world. It's like a fantasy version of like virtual reality, the Fade, kind of. It's, it's, it's like a kind of interactive internet that you could just like plug yourself into every time you go to sleep. I get that impression from the Fade, particularly when you play the Trespasser DLC. So if the two games really did take place in the same universe, I think the most plausible explanation they could come up with is that Dragon Age is some kind of like AI generated virtual world in Mass Effect or something. This is getting a bit meta, isn't it? Should we move on? Should we move on before we get any deeper into this? But anyway, yes, that was just like a, a, an interesting little side note about the Krogan who turn up in Dragon Age quite often. Next, the Kossith. Following on from mysterious races that we may not have encountered yet, the Kossith are the race that the Kanari originate from. Maybe. Kind of. Possibly. Perhaps. We're not really sure whether the Kossith were a race, or an empire, or a group of races, or a religion. What we do know is that they come from somewhere other than Thedas, possibly to the east, across the Boeric Ocean. They once worshipped gods and were probably not too different to the people of Thedas. Then Kosloon, one of their philosophers, founded the Kanari religion. The Kossith's old temples were pulled down and most of them were forced to convert to the Kune. So this is interesting, Kanari technically refers to the religion, not the race. Yes, so interestingly, the horned race that we generally refer to as the Kanari no longer consider themselves Kossith, which means their race technically doesn't have a name because Kanari is the religion. Like, you can be an elf and be a Kanari. You can also be a member of the horned race who is not Kanari, as in doesn't follow the Kanari religion, in which case you are Tal Vashoff or simply Vashoff but we'll get to that distinction later in the alphabet. Yeah, so technically the race doesn't have a name, but, you know, if you are part of the horned race, uh, you will be referred to as Kanari by everybody. So we'll just call them the Kanari, you know, just because we need something to call them. Yes, yeah, so Iron Bull says this about the Kossith. The people we came from, they're called the Kossith, but we don't use that word for the race. We came south to Thedas because the Kossith were... I don't know. We had to leave. The stories aren't clear. But I don't expect they look much like us. Whatever they are. And I don't even know what the hell I'm supposed to make of that. There is some evidence that the Kanari are a genetically altered race. Bull gives us a theory that the Tamasrans mixed dragon's blood into them at some point, thus giving them horns, reaver abilities, and a natural affinity with dragons. There are a few bits of dialogue you get if you play as a Kanari Inquisitor. Kieran may lament that the Inquisitor's blood does not belong to their people, while Corypheus will claim your race is not a race, it is a mistake. Whatever that means. The first known contact with the Kossif in Thedas is actually long before the Kanari invasion. In ancient Thedas, a group of Kossif supposedly landed in the south and settled in the Kokari wilds before being wiped out during the first blight. Their women were taken as brood mothers and gave birth to the first ogres. This suggests that the Kossith did have horns at that point, because the ogres have horns. Though most likely that's just been squeezed into the lore to help explain why there were darkspawn ogres before the Kanari ever invaded Thedas. Because yes, the type of darkspawn that you get depends on the type of brood mother that they come from. So the darkspawn take women from each race and turn them into brood mothers, and they give birth to the darkspawn. So dwarven brood mothers birth the genlocks, human um, brood mothers birth the herlocks. Elves, I think, birth the shrieks, and then Kanari birth the ogres. Uh, yes, it is worth noting that humans are also not native to Thedas and instead came to the continent centuries before the Kanari, fleeing something. It's possible that they came from the same continent that the Kossith did. It's even possible that they are the Kossith. Maybe they were the ones who didn't want to convert to the Kune and fled instead. Um, there's all sorts of theories about what the Kanari were originally. Are they genetically altered humans? Are they genetically altered elves? They do have pointed ears, after all, so maybe the Kossith were an empire of humans and elves? Or maybe they were something different altogether? They might even still be out there. We have no idea what it was that brought the Kanari to Thedas. Like, maybe they were fleeing something. Maybe that's a storyline for a future game, who knows? So yes, we don't really know much about the Kossith, we don't really know what they were. We, uh, yeah, they could have been humans, they could have been elves, they could have been something different completely. 
Were they a race? Were they an empire? We have absolutely no idea. I've left you with more questions than answers, I'm afraid. And it's not going to get any better because we continue in our theme of annoyingly vague and hard to answer questions with Kieran. So Kieran is Morrigan's son in Inquisition, and depending on the choices you make in Origins, he may not exist at all. Kieran is conceived during a ritual performed by Morrigan on the eve of the final battle against the Archdemon. He has three potential fathers, including Alistair, Loghain, and the Warden if you are playing as a male character. If you go through with the ritual, then when the Archdemon is slain, his soul will pass into Kieran, and both Grey Wardens survive the final battle. It is worth noting that if you are playing as a male warden who is in a romance with Morrigan, you can reject the ritual but still spend the night with her and Kieran will still be conceived but will not carry the soul of the Archdemon and will instead be a normal child. Now this creates a bit of an interesting lore discrepancy as your warden can be a dwarf. If a male dwarf impregnates Morrigan naturally, this is the first ever indication we get that dwarves and humans can have children together. And, much like children between humans and elves, Kieran is genetically human. Now, if he's conceived during the ritual, you can explain all of that away as him being a magic baby. But if he's conceived naturally, I don't know. Maybe we're just sort of supposed to pretend it's not a thing? I mean, it's probably not an option that many people take, and there's nothing in the law that specifically states humans and dwarves can't conceive children. It's just not something that we've encountered anywhere else. So... I don't really know what the deal is with that. Anyway, if Kieran is conceived in Origins, he turns up during Inquisition, when Morrigan joins the Inquisitor at Skyhold. If he does have the soul of the Old God, he says some interesting things. He calls Morrigan the Inheritor who awaits the next age, which is interesting. He also makes several comments to the Inquisitor, depending on race and class. I've already mentioned what he says to a Canary Inquisitor, but the most interesting one I find is what he could say to an elf. I don't know why your people want to look like that. That's what he says to an elven inquisitor. I don't know why your people want to look like that. Now, I don't know if he's just referring to the Dalish tattoos. Because if you're playing as an elf, you're playing as Dalish. And we later learn that the tattoos were originally slave markings. Um, he also mentions titans to a dwarven inquisitor. Interestingly, if you play as a human, he will only reference your class, not your race. So the humans remain as mysterious as ever, like we literally know less about them and where they came from than any of the other races, which is fascinating. We just know nothing about humans whatsoever. Oh, do you know what? Actually, humans are another thing that connect Dragon Age and Mass Effect, now I come to think of it. They've both got humans in them. Okay, right, there. no, let's not. We're, we're going to get dragged into more meta theories. Let's not go there. Um, yes, back to Kieran, right? <laughs> <laughs> that just popped into my head then, though they've both got humans, right? That connects them as well. Um, yes, if Kieran possesses the old god's soul, Flemeth will take it from him during Inquisition, so he ends up being a normal child in the end anyway. Well, as normal as any child of Morrigan's could realistically be, especially after having been raised in the crossroads. But anyway, uh, depending on who Kieran's father is, he can have a claim to the Ferelden throne in two different ways. If he is Alistair's son, then he carries Theron blood in him, and therefore has a claim, kind of regardless of whether Alistair is king or not, to be honest. If Loghain is his father, and Honora remains queen, he is Honora's half-brother. So, he's, you know, he's the queen there, kind of. Uh, Morrigan claims, however, that she will never let Kieran take the throne. Which is all well and good when he's a wee Ben, love, but once he grows up and becomes a rebellious teenager, I don't really know how the hell she would stop him, especially considering, like... He's got the soul of an old god in him. Although not by the end of Inquisition, I suppose, but still, like, she's all like, oh, I'd never let him take the throne. <laughs> like, yeah, okay. Uh, yes, Kieran can also carry elf blood in him in one of two ways, either if he is fathered by the Warden and the Warden is an elf, of course, or if he is fathered by Alistair, who is elf-blooded himself. Final note, in real life, Kieran is a Celtic name, which means black, dark-haired, or little dark one. This might well be a reference to the fact that Kieran is most often conceived during a dark magic ritual. It could also be a reference to the surname of Morrigan's voice actress, Claudia Black, and her son Odin, who actually voices Kieran. And I have to say, Odin Black is the best name in the world, isn't it? Isn't that just like the coolest name ever? Anyway, finally, Caitlin, a nice little light one to finish on. Caitlin is a character encountered in Redcliffe in Origins during the battle for Redcliffe. Uh, her mother has been killed by the undead streaming out of the castle, leaving her an orphan who must care for her younger brother, Bevan. Bevan has, however, run off and must be tracked down by the Warden. 
We find Bevan hiding in a cupboard in his home. He claims he is looking for his grandfather's sword, the green blade, to fight the monsters. The warden can either leave the sword where it is, take the sword and pay Caitlin for it, take the sword and not pay for it, what the hell is she going to do about it after all, or use the sword in the Battle of Redcliffe and then return it to Caitlin and her brother afterwards. A male warden can also ask Caitlin for a kiss in exchange for saving her brother, assuming you're playing as some sort of fucking creep. What happens to Caitlin depends on the choices you make in the game. If you refuse to help Redcliffe battle the undead, you'll encounter Caitlin as an undead corpse in Redcliffe's castle. If you pay her for her sword and give her enough money, she will travel to Denerim and become a successful businesswoman before eventually marrying Ban Tegan. Now, come Inquisition, when Ban Tegan turns up again, his marriage to Caitlin will not be mentioned, but it's not stated that they didn't marry, so I suppose it's up to your headcanon to decide. That's usually the best way anyway. Um, and if you use the sword and then return it, Bevan apparently becomes a famous adventurer. Um, yes, because he's got his grandfather's sword. So yes, those are the things that can happen to Caitlin. Honourable mentions for this episode, we have the Kakari Wild, of course, but I've mentioned that quite a few times in all the uh, various entries, so I didn't think it was worth it. We've got Krem. I, I wanted to do a one on Krem, but all the other ones kind of like pushed him out of the way. I'm sorry, Krem, darling. I do like you a lot. And of course, Kos Loon, the, uh, the uh, philosopher who started the uh, the Q. -in. But uh, we're going to have a lot of Kanari related things around Q the Q entry, because there aren't many um, things in Dragon Age beginning with Q that don't relate to the Canari. So, you know, we'll have a whole Canari episode around Q, and uh, I'm sure Costlune will uh, come up during that one. Uh, no contribution from Fred in this episode, I'm afraid. Fred Fred didn't contribute anything. He's gone on strike temporarily because, I don't know, I, uh, I, something about being forced to work 24 hours a day without sleep or food being a breach of his human rights or something like that, I don't know. I'll get him back in line for the next episode, though. Just as soon as I remember where I put the taser. Anyway, I'll see you tomorrow, my darlings, and we will tackle L.